My name's Sarah Orton. I am a tandem instructor. I'm chief instructor at Skydive GB in Bridlington. Um, but today I'm here in more of my work role, which is I'm the service manager for youth justice in the city of York. Um, due to this role, I deal a lot with safeguarding incidents. I'm dealing with quite a lot at the moment. Um, you've probably seen there's been quite a high profile incident in York. So safeguarding is top of my agenda most of the time. Um, when I went on to my advanced instructors course, this was something that I looked into further for my specialist um, subject, and this is where this has kind of stemmed from today. So what I'd like to do today is to um, give you some understanding of what safeguarding is and the relation of that with the law and your own, um, your own skydive centres. So the key thing is, what is safeguarding and how does it work? So the definition is something that serves as a protection or defence or ensures safety and to protect from harm or damage with an appropriate measure. So safeguarding is a preventative measure to prevent harm further down the line. So... Law is a very varying type thing. Criminal law and civil law are two completely different ball games. So criminal law deals with crime and everything to do with it across the board. And how that's judged is beyond reasonable doubt. So if you were to go into court for a specific crime, the only way that they could judge you at the end of it is beyond reasonable doubt. Civil law is very, very different. This is judged on the balance of probability. So if you appear in court being sued on some type of um, civil sort of disagreement that's happened, they will only look at probability as opposed to um, reasonable doubt. So the next thing that I looked at was tort law. Um, tort law comes under civil law and it's classed as a civil wrong. So that's when somebody feels that you've done something against them that they can't possibly agree with. And the link of this is the duty of care, um, with that being the le <coughs> legal obligation imposed on individuals or organisations. Now, it's worth considering that a body corpora is a non-natural individual but do get sued within civil law. So what I was sort of considering is, as a PTO, as tandem instructors, do we have a duty of care? And whichever direction you look at it, the answer is yes, we certainly do. So the law itself, criminal and civil, is always conflicting in legislation. The more that you look into law and the more that you study law, the more you'll realise that most things tend to contradict themselves. So what I looked into was the law in relation to safeguarding. I looked at um, 16 to 18-year-olds. I looked at um, what could be vulnerable adults and I looked into all the laws that were surrounding it. And the key thing that I found is no single law defines the age of a child, which I personally found quite shocking. There's various legislation that defines the age of a child in different remits, but no one specific law. So that's what I was saying. Sorry, specific age limits are set out in legislation for different types of things. So the UN Convention Rights of a Child is anybody below the age of 18 years old. The Children's Act of 1989, again, terms a child as under the age of 18. However, the Sexual Offences Act 2003 has consent at 16, so are they deeming a child between 16 to 18? It reads as not. So, you're probably sitting here thinking, well, she's talking a lot about law, but what's that got to do with skydiving and what we're looking at? So, we work with eight, under 18s. We work with that 16 and 17-year-old age group, which I've highlighted comes under different laws and different legislations and different policies. We also work with potentially vulnerable or at-risk adults. Um, if you look at things like children in care, they're classed as children until the age of 25, potentially, if they have some form of sort of learning difficulties, disabilities, etc. So we could potentially be dealing with these people at our centres. These could be the people that you have attached to the front of you. People with disabilities, we see a lot of that within skydive centres. Again, different legislations, different laws that they can come under. And we also look at gender. Now, why I looked at gender wasn't looking 
particularly at law, what I was looking at was gender in relation to safeguarding. Because there's a common sort of misconception that all things to do with allegations, etc., etc., will be against males. That's not true. Allegations could go against males and females across the board. So what we have is the BPA Code of Practice. Has everybody read this? Yeah, you all have a knowledge that we have this document and the purpose of it. So we've got the Code of Conduct, but we've also got the Code of Practice for BPA instructors. Now, I analysed this document to see where it fitted within my own Skydive Centre, and I find this a really, really good document that can be potentially protective of us as instructors, as well as damning to us when claims were going in if you weren't following the rules. So I, I think it's a great document. It highlights various priorities, um, including the rights, which is championing the rights of others. It looks at relationships, the relationships that we should have with our customers and our client base. It looks at responsibilities, which is ourself, and that links to that duty of care that I was speaking about. As the tandem instructor, you have a duty of care to your student whilst they're in your whilst you're looking after them, basically. So one of the questions that I looked at was my own PTO. Did I have a safeguarding procedure or policy in place? And the initial answer that I came up with was no, I don't. I have myself and I have the knowledge of safeguarding that I have and looking after my customers and my client base. But did I have any set down and written procedure that could be used if there was an allegation at my drop zone? And the answer was no. And I mean, across the board, pretty much, there might be the odd exception, but that was what I found when I looked into it. Then I looked at the instructors that I had at the PTO and how would they address a concern if it was to come up? I mean, at Skydive GB, we have myself, which it would come through me because I would take a lead on that. But when you're looking at other drop zones, I mean, I suppose the first port of call would be to go to your chief instructor or your DZ owner, but then where do they go? So procedures were needed so people had some idea of what to do with it. Because at the end of the day, we can't just ring the BPA, because what will they do with an allegation or something problematic? They also have to deal with it. So if we can deal with it earlier on within our own drop zones, it's very useful, know who to speak to. The potential outcomes of safeguarding allegations, which could be pretty much anything, um, the, the usual type of allegation that could come up might be, for example, a sexual allegation. My tandem instructor touched me, this happened, that happened. The BPA then have to field this with solicitors, etc., etc. And the potential outcomes of this is a lot of people are affected. The first person that will be affected by any form of allegation, in my opinion, is the victim. Because the person who has made the allegation actually feels that some wrong's been done to them as an individual. The next person that it's going to impact on is the tandem instructor themselves. <coughs> Massive problem to them. Close to that, you've got the PTO itself, you've got the BPA, you've got family and friends, etc., etc. So the potential outcomes are usually negative ones that could lead to being sued, etc., or even a criminal record. DBS. I heard some people talking about DBS earlier behind me. Um, do we know what DBS is? Disclosure That's right. It's Disclosure and Barring System. It used to be the old CRB checks, and it's now called DBS checks. Back in the day, you used to be able to contact the police and say, I'd like some news if this person's ever offended, etc., etc., and a bit of background history. It used to be called, I think it was a Phoenix system. You can't do that anymore. It's all about DBS and, and how DBS works. So DBS will give you the very basic. Uh, you, there's three types of DBS. There's a basic DBS, there's a standard DBS, I think, and an enhanced DBS. Those that work with young children and very vulnerable, so I'm talking the littlies, etc., or highly vulnerable people, will need an enhanced DBS check. That's what I need in my daily work in life. What's interesting, though, is my enhanced DBS check means absolutely nothing when I'm at work at the parachute centre because it's two different locations, basically, two different job roles. So it means nothing. So what we needed to look at was DBS that could be functional for tandem instructors. Now, not all tandem instructors work at one centre. 
So there was no sort of roaming DBS check that you could have because I was looking into all the options as to whether this could be done or not be done, whether it was useful. The other thing that I noted is a DBS check brings up previous offences. So if you were to offend the day after your DBS check, essentially it wouldn't be on there. So it's a bit like your car MOT really. You have your car done on that day, then your brakes fail the day after. Same sort of scenario, and how would you check that, and how would you keep a record of that? So is it an option? I don't know. One that I've spoken to the BPA about, one that I'm speaking to DBS about at the moment, and to see where we can take it. One thing I would say, if you do choose to have somebody as a safeguarding lead within your PTO, within your drop zone, they should essentially, you should have somebody on site that has a DBS check that's relevant to where you are that you can approach. So allegations, who's at risk of allegations? Absolutely everybody in my opinion. Anybody who's around the drop zone. <coughs> the potential impact I've already spoken about, it's devastating. The impact could be you with a criminal record, it could be you being sued as an individual under the civil law, the duty of care. PTO can be being sued. Absolutely anything can come out of it. Also, with allegations, mud tends to stick. Um, if an allegation's made, it may be completely unfounded, but it's still in people's mind, and you will always be the one that had that allegation. It, it just tends to be there. So they are very, very damaging. Guilty and proven until proven innocent. To a point, that can be how you seem to be judged in law. You're innocent until proven guilty. So that one's always worth remembering if there is an allegation made against you. So the first one, that, that's criminal law. And the second one being civil law, which just stands for the thing speaks for itself. Just an interesting thing. So in civil law, an allegation, it would have to be sort of looking at the, the doubt, etc., etc. So other things to consider was the power imbalance between the tandem instructor and the tandem, inst uh, the tandem student. It is definitely there. As the tandem instructor, you need to save your student's life, in their opinion. You need to do everything to make sure... They go from the top to the bottom in one piece. That power imbalance is huge. They're putting an awful lot of trust in you. And that's something that needs to be sort of bore in mind. Knowledge is power. That's how people see you in that role. And that potentially can be abusive or positive. Now, the majority of tandem instructors that I've ever come across use that very, very positively. And they... they will go out of their way to ensure that their students feel safe, they feel secure, and they know what's going on. But it's just worth being mindful of. It can be an abusive relationship. Something to keep an eye out for on drop zones. I'm just going to play you a short video um, that's in relation to kitting up students, what can potentially look very wrong, even though it may not be, um, and ways to just come around that. <laughs> now, you might laugh, because it's Steve and Karen Saunders for stars, but essentially those are things that I've seen uh, regularly, picking people up and chest straps and standing behind them, so on and so forth. And it's when you make it into a video, it looks almost comedy, but essentially you do see little bits throughout the drop zone. 
I mean, there's a lot of key things there that were happening that shouldn't have been happening, but I'll, um, I'll talk through those a bit more. One of the main things that I've seen on drop zones is people kitting tandem students up in a little room that's not in clear view, not open, not transparent, which was what I was trying to reflect in that video. We were actually filming around a door. There's a lot to be said to protect yourself. You know, when you are kitting these students up, you are having to touch them, you are having to do up chest straps, you are having to do up leg straps. But there's ways of doing it to make your life easy and there's ways of doing it to make them feel more safe and secure as well. Now, in our life, it's normal. It's normal to stand there and do somebody's chest strap up, to be kneeling in front of them, tightening up leg straps. That's just what we see. But if you're that person that's just come in from the normal outside world, that's not quite as normal as it might be to us. And it's just worth being mindful of all that. I'll just play in the next bit. I'll try to. Okay, that started going wrong, so I'll just stop that there. What you've seen, though, when kitting up compared to the first time, was the key thing was talking to the person, telling them what you're doing, telling them why you do it. It makes them feel safer. Standing to the side to tighten up leg straps as opposed to kneeling down directly in front of them, talking to them about you need to do up the chest strap. These are all things that everybody knows. They're just sometimes things that we forget, but they're things that can avoid an allegation. Now, as a tandem instructor, if you're in a room with a person and you're kitting them up individually and an allegation comes in, I mean, the question is, how are you going to protect yourself and how are you going to prove otherwise? It, it's just all worth considering at all times. So, kitting up, I mean, when you looked at how Steve was kitting up Karen, who, who anybody doesn't know, is his wife and it was all okay. <laughs> just, just so you're aware. <laughs> and I didn't get paid. You didn't get paid, no. But when, when you look at that, essentially, if that was somebody who was a tandem student and not Steve's wife, they could well make the allegation that they had been sexually abused. At various times when he, he was touching her chest area, her legs area, that allegation could come in. And my key role is to make sure that you're not on the receiving end of these allegations. So by just kitting people up in a manner that's highly professional, talking to them throughout, we can always let them know that they're safe and we're professional in our approach. Potential issues that I see for tandem instructors, obviously kitting up students I've covered quite in depth. Reciprocating inappropriate banter, you quite often see it, don't you? There's always that one that will come in and it's the tandem student with the banter and you just reciprocate without really thinking. That can take you to very, very dangerous ground. A professional approach will always avoid that. Checking chest straps. Checking chest straps in the aircraft is a difficult matter. However you look at it, it's something that we have to do. And there's ways and means of doing it that can make life a lot easier. I see a lot of people and they'll say to your ta the tandem student, put your arms up. So they do. And they do the reach round and grab the chest strap. All the tandem student sees is two hands coming round to where their chest area is. A bit worrying. So the way that we've done it at Skydive GB is we'll check from the side pull the chest strap out and just check that the buckle's done up from there. It's quite an easy way of doing it. If there are other people on the aircraft, there's a camera flyer, we make sure that it's all on there. Now, we might seem like we're a bit obsessive with regards to this, but it's just in the names of safety. Last person in the aircraft. There's always one, the last tandem pair in the aircraft. Potentially, if there was an allegation made that you'd done something at that last point in the aircraft, how are you ever going to avoid that? The answer is you aren't. There is no way of avoiding it. So again, it's just about being professional. Make sure the allegation doesn't come in. Under canopy, again, unless you're on hand cam, 
if an allegation comes in, it's something that needs to be dealt with. Matter of avoiding it. Debriefing individually. Um, this isn't just for tandem instructors. This is generally. I see quite a lot of debriefing going on in rooms with closed doors, etc., etc. My advice would be just open the door. Be visible. Let people see you. So as I've already said, always explain what you're doing and why. Explanation of safety and necessity. What I was linking to there was such things as chest straps. You know, we have to check this in the plane. And now tell them about chest straps while we're on the ground in the briefing. This will be done. This is what your tandem instructor will do once you're in the aircraft. Professional approach, that avoids everything. As long as you're professional throughout, there's no reason why anybody would ever think any otherwise of you. <coughs> and your own professional boundaries, you know, when, when people are being essentially inappropriate with you, you don't need to respond to that. You have your own boundaries as well. So I've talked to you about safeguarding. It's whistle-stop because I really don't have much time and I'm fully, fully aware of that. Um, you do have to safeguard your students. Your students are important. That's what we're there for. We're there to look after them from them walking in the door throughout the whole of the skydive and then basically until they leave. We're there to make sure they're safe. We have that duty of care and that's what we need to do. But my concern and where I'm coming from, is safeguard yourself as tandem instructors, okay? You don't want anything coming in, allegation-wise, that then you have to explain to your wife, to your husband, your children here about. You don't want any of those things. The, the Skylife Centre, we don't want that. We don't want that coming into us. And the BPA, they certainly don't want that coming into them either. They don't want further claims coming in, allegations coming in, because they all need to be dealt with. So look after yourselves, and that really is what this is about today. Look after your colleagues as well. If I see somebody's kitting up, a 16, 17-year-old, I'll stand there. It doesn't hurt. I'll make sure that I'm there. I'll make sure that, that the student can see me, that they know I'm around and they're not on their own. And all I'm doing is looking after my, my other tandem instructors. And at all times, consider your actions. Think about what you're doing and just, just keep yourself safe and keep your colleagues safe. Now, Jeff said at the beginning, we're looking at bringing in um, safeguarding policies. And these will be for each of your skydive centres where you jump. So that will actually be in place, and there will be a procedure and a protocol that can be followed if, anything, if there are any form of allegations or any issues that link to safeguarding your friends, others, etc. And knowing who your safeguarding lead is within your drop zone, it will probably be your, um, your chief instructor or somebody nominated. It's everyone's duty. We owe it to our students. That's why we're there for our students. We can protect ourselves. The preventative strategies are already happening. That will be provided for you. And documentation can reflect safeguarding, which, again, that's about the policies that are coming in as, we, uh, as we're going on.